Good evening, everyone. The official good evening. Thank you very much for joining us tonight at the Art Students League for our live talk series. My name is Allison Green, manager of, <clears throat> excuse me, manager of this live talk series. Uh, we are pleased tonight to be joined by author Laura Reykjavik, who will be presenting on her recently published work, Culture Strike, Art and Museums in an Age of Protest. Laura will be joined in conversation partway through tonight's program by our own executive director and artistic director, Michael Hall, and the two of them will discuss in detail the themes that appear throughout this book and throughout uh, the work that Laura is discussing. Laura is a New York-based writer and curator and former president and executive director of the Queens Museum. She recently served as interim director of the Leslie Lohman Museum of Art, and prior to that, she worked at Creative Time and the Dia Art Foundations. Laura was a Rockefeller Foundation Fellow at the Bellagio Center and was awarded the inaugural Emily H. Tremaine Journalism Fellowship for curators at Hyperallergic. Please join me in welcoming Laura this evening. Thank you, Allison. Hi everyone, I just wanna first of all thank Allison and Michael for thinking of me and inviting me to participate in this series to have this conversation with you all tonight. Thank all of you for coming in the rain. <laughs> it's pretty miserable out there. Um, I guess I thought I'd start by, um, by reading to you a little bit from the introduction of my book, which will give you a sense of the framing of the, the book itself, um, and to give you a sense of where I'm coming from as both a uh, cultural producer, uh, an art worker, and somebody who um, loves our cultural institutions a great deal, but also sees uh, the problematics of the way they function in the world. So, um, Introduction. We're living in an age of protest. Around the globe, radical movements from prison and debt abolition to extinction rebellion climate activism have penetrated mainstream discourse. Culture and art have necessarily also come under fire. While art has enormous potential to shift society, the institutions upon which it relies help hold systems of power in place. As much as I love museums and have dedicated my career to them, they are repositories of cultural hegemony, mirrors of society's ills, from enormous wealth gaps and other legacies of colonialism to the exclusion of historically marginalized groups. Museums and cultural spaces are part of the systems that the protests hope to undo. I believe this undoing and redoing can not only make museums better for more people, but also map ways to make change in society at large. My most recent experiences at the time of the writing of the book <laughs> as director of the Queen's Museum was by turns exhilarating, challenging to my core, and heartbreaking. And those experiences are central to my thinking. I led the museum for three extraordinary years through moments that proved to be high points of my professional life and others that threatened to thwart my deeply held convictions of art and culture's vital engagement and societal change. A public museum, the Queen's Museum, is situated within a public park in one of the most ethnically and culturally diverse geographies on the planet. In New York, in a city of immigrants, Queen's is host to, two, to the New York City's two main airports. It is the place most newcomers arrive. Many stay in the string of neighborhoods along the seven train, the borough's spine, which transports a population that speaks over 138 different languages and dialects. Each subway stop opens doors into different cultures, and yet we're all New Yorkers. In awe of these realities, I took up my post at the Queens Museum in January 2015. Just 18 months later, the election of Donald Trump would dramatically shift the landscape in which I worked. While the museum remained on an upward trajectory of increased attention, support, and visibility, the results of the election deeply impacted the staff and our publics and collaborators surrounding the museum. 
Over a decade before I arrived at the Queens Museum, community organizers had been hired in a brilliant move to connect with nearby immigrant communities. Led initially by Jay Shri Abishandani and then Prerna Reddy, this organizing effort created a new model for how museums could engage with their publics. The goal was not just to bring people to the museum, but rather to leverage the museum's resources to surface and enact the desires of the communities surrounding it via their cultural offering, or by, via cultural organizing. In the aftermath of the election on November 8th, 2016, the Trump administration's policies and rhetoric unleashed a Pandora's box of hate. And one of its primary targets was immigrants. At the museum, these new conditions were no mere abstraction, but an all too harsh reality. 5% of the Queens Museum staff had received Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals, or DACA, protections. President, this was President Obama's um, executive order that provided legal status to many people brought to the United States without documents as children. This group heard Donald Trump's promises to repeal DACA, without which they would risk losing temporary relief from legal uncertainty, or even face deportation to countries they had never even visited. Further, in the weeks following the election, many of the people with whom the museum's staff had collaborated for more than a decade and a half through its free family programs, the New Yorkers art classes, taught in over a dozen languages, gatherings and classes at Immigrant Movement International in Corona, and other long-term partnerships, these same people now feared leaving their homes and even sending their children to school. Whether or not the participants in these programs possessed documentation, there was worried of being caught up in a raid or being in the wrong place at the wrong time. I started getting Facebook alerts from various local groups spreading news of Immigration and Customs Enforcement, also known as ICE, being at one or another subway stop or heading to a particular neighborhood. Some even claimed that the alerts themselves were fake, sent out on social media to stir further anxiety and fear. City council members planned special sessions to reassure their constituents, and New York City Mayor Bill de Blasio convened a town hall in Corona with then council member Julissa Ferreras Copeland, along with a cadre of New York City agency heads and local uniformed police, to reassure immigrants that we were all New Yorkers, no matter immigration status, and that local police forces and the educational system should be seen as allies. In this climate at the museum, we started holding weekly all-staff meetings. We contacted immigrant rights groups to be sure to stay updated on any changes in policy, whether local or federal, and shared this information with our networks. We coordinated with city agencies to be sure our staff and publics could access important information about their rights. We assembled a list of the museum's resources that could be lent to local groups, and we decided to join the art strike called for Inauguration Day. On January 20th, 2017, while the Queens Museum was closed to regular operations, the, the staff decided to create a program that invited the public to work with a printmaking collective on creating posters, buttons, and other ephem ephemera for the coming protests. Over 300 people gathered in the atrium that day. It was raining and very similar to the weather today, in fact. I was deeply moved by this gathering of retired school teachers, artists, students, local moms and grandmas, and throughout the day, several in attendance thanked us for creating a space to gather on a day they felt so vulnerable. On that rainy day, it never would have crossed my mind that just over a year later, I would resign my post. What happened over the following 12 months would, improve, would prove immensely complex. Several trustees did not like the fact that we were joining the inauguration day strike. Their position was that we should continue to do the work we had always done, but to do it quietly. At least one trustee expressed a fear of retribution from Trump via punitive tax audits of board members. From my perspective, not only had the political environment created a predicament in managing a staff with a significant number of increasingly precarious immigrants, I also felt strongly that we as a group, as a cultural institution, needed to be forthright and direct in our support for the communities with whom we had built a great deal over the years. Trust was at issue. The staff and I drafted a restatement of our values, which we felt would be important to buttress our work. 
It took the form of a letter from the director that we posted to the museum's website. We all worked on it as a Google Doc. I presented the value statement at the next board meeting where it was unanimously approved. The statement has since been removed and it included the following. The Queen's Museum asserts a deep commitment to freedom of expression and intentionally supports and celebrates difference and multiplicity as fundamental to our collective liberation. We believe that art can shift the ways in which we experience our world, and therefore art, artists, and cultural institutions have a powerful role to play in society. Therefore, the Queen's Museum advocates for art as a tool of positive social change, critical thinking, discussion and debate, discovery and imagination, and to make multiple histories and realities visible. The Queen's Museum supports and initiates projects and programs that are inspired by actively listening to the needs and aspirations of the communities we serve and consider to be our valued partners. The Queen's Museum works to engender respect for diversity of cultures, broaden access to ideas and art, and connect the public to opportunities for civic agency. The Queen's Museum uses our resources, human, financial, environmental, and beyond, to create greater equity, inclusiveness, and sustainability, both within our institution and within the broader society. Meanwhile, outside the Queen's Museum, artists and art workers, curators, professors, and others started organizing with, as one Google group's name made clear, a sense of emergency. Around this time, New York's Museum of Modern Art installed an exhibition of art from their collection by artists who would no longer be welcomed into the United States due to the Trump administration's so-called Muslim ban. The Solomon R. Guggenheim Museum submitted amicus briefs to the Supreme Court to overturn this ban, which were co-signed by the Association of Art Museum Directors, the American Association of Museums, and more than 100 museums all over the United States. Smaller organizations were doing whatever they could. From the sense of emergency cohort, a new working group formed, calling ourselves Art Space Sanctuary. The group was headed by Abu Farman, an artist and professor of anthropology at the New School, as well as a dedicated immigra immigration rights activist. We looked to, to the sanctuary movement of the 1980s in Latin America, largely carried out by clergy members committed to liberation theology and using churches to shelter people fleeing violence, and the new sanctuary movement of the 2000s spearheaded by, interfaith group, by an interfaith group of leaders in the United States seeking justice for migrants and immigrants. As we thought that art space sanctuary could communicate that cultural spaces were in fact for everyone, and that within these spaces we, there could be ways of conveying care and support. The Queen's Museum had a long history of collaboration with frontline organizations, including the Immigrant Advocacy Group, Make the Road, the Addiction Support Group, Drogadictos Anonymous, among others. The idea was to create a series of protocols that would allow museums and cultural spaces to make connections between audiences and, the or and these types of organizations so that we could support vulnerable po populations and connect them to the people doing the frontline work. I strongly believe that the Queen's Museum would be an ideal organization to embrace this concept given our long-term relationships and the extant programming of the museum. We hope to gather a critical mass of cultural organizations that would become arts-based sanctuaries by agreeing to the guidelines Farman had developed and made public via a website. This, we hope, would signal the cultural sector's support of the vulnerable people who worked in the museum as well as visited. The guidelines were flexible, and given that the Queen's Museum already had relationships with many frontline groups, it made sense for us to sign on. Buoyed by the enthusiastic support of several trustees, I presented it at our next board meeting. The response was profoundly disappointing. A handful of board members thought the idea completely untenable, expressing fears that the notion of cultural sanctuary would turn the museum into a place for people to hide out or sleep. That's a direct quote. A fundamental misunderstanding of the concept. However, I will say that if our circumstances here in the United States mirrored those happening in Poland or Ukraine at the moment, where I have seen museums like the Museum of Modern Art in Warsaw transformed into a receiving center for refugees, of course I think that would be an appropriate way to use a cultural space. With outspoken opposition to this initiative, it was impossible to move it forward. Moreover, the rhetoric of the rejection was grounded in the notion that as a public institution, we should not and indeed could not 
quote unquote, take sides in political debates surrounding immigration. We had to, repudi we had to repudiate a pro-immigrant initiative like arts-based sanctuary in order to maintain a supposedly neutral position. And this was demoralizing. The, con the conditions were, the, the situation was further complicated in June 2017 when the mission of Israel to the United Nations contacted the museum ab about renting the galleries to hold an anniversary event for the historic vote that paved the way for the creation of the State of Israel in 1948. Interestingly, the Queen's Museum's physical building was an appealing location for the event because it was actually where the, US, the United Nations General Assembly met from 1946 to 1950 prior to the Queen's Museum's existence. The proposal was to reenact the vote that took place on November 27, 1947. Then Vice President Mike Pence was to be their keynote speaker addressing hundreds of invited guests. I felt deeply uncomfortable with this space rental proposal. Typically, the rentals of the museum were for weddings, bar mitzvahs, and other types of celebrations or corporate events. This was very different a very different kind of event. Not only was I gravely concerned about the operational impacts of an event of this scale, as well as its, secure, um, its security implications, but the, the, missions of the, confir the mission's confirmation that the Vice President of the United States would be in attendance more than four months before the event itself strongly suggested the political nature of the proposed event. With its government sponsorship and a roster of politicians speaking and attending, I believed this was an event engineered to support the views of a particular government aim or policy, and that this violated what had been a long-standing practice of not renting the space for such political events. Recognizing the unique character of this proposed rental, the matter was escalated to the board for consideration. I recommended against hosting it, but the decision was ultimately up to the trustees. After much debate, the board decided to decline the mission of Israel's proposed event. Two days later, an article appeared in the Jerusalem Post stating that I was anti-Israel because I had edited a book about cultural resistance that contains a section about BDS, a movement inspired by Palestinian civil society's call to boycott, divest, and sanction Israel. The article was highly critical of me for my supposed canceling of the event. A New York City council member called for my dismissal and started asking seeking support for a petition, and the New York Post piled on with additional criticism. The board then reacted with great speed, reinstating the event it had days earlier rejected. No public statement corrected the misperception that the initial decision was mine. I found myself under an avalanche of hate for alleged anti-Semitism. In the aftermath of these articles, I felt I had to prove to board members, never mind the online universe, that I was now, that was now propelling vitriol at me at a staggering speed, that I was indeed not an anti-Semite. My Jewish husband counseled me to talk publicly about his family's history, to relay that his grandparents were Auschwitz survivors and that our son had a bris, and that my grandmother helped Jewish men escape across the border of fascist Italy during the Second World War. It felt horrible to trot out these facts about my existence and the effort to convince people who had known me for years that I did not hate people for their cultural or religious backgrounds. Meanwhile, the work of the Queen's Museum was garnering broader acknowledgement by the public. It was particularly encouraging when the New York Times profiled my work at the museum. We had just opened a series of success successful exhibitions, among them Never Built New York, which featured an array of architectural pl projects net planned but never realized that made unique use of the panorama, which as a 10,000 10, square foot model of every single building in New York City, um, that is the centerpiece of the Queen's Museum's collection. I was also deep into planning a major exhibition of artist Mel Chin's work, which I would co-curate with Manon Sloan and the nonprofit arts organization no longer empty at the Queen's Museum. It would fill the entire museum with major projects that would spill into various public sites throughout New York City. Additionally, we had received significant grants from prestigious foundations. With these promising fundraising results, we had achieved a financial milestone towards which I had been working since my first days at the museum. There was a lot to be proud of for everyone associated with the institution. Nonetheless, as fall unfurled and the mission of Israel's event took place at the museum, the politics of the event became clearer. At the event, Mike Pence delivered a speech as planned. He, 
And that speech went far beyond the celebration of Israel's anniversary. It turned into a 45-minute policy speech previewing the Trump administration's intent to move the U.S. Embassy from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem. Trump made his public announcement of the move from the White House just a week later. And in the days that followed, protests led to violence in Jerusalem and criticism from many US allies and the United Nations. Against precedent, the Queens Museum's building had been used as a backdrop for an announcement of, ma of a major shift in US foreign policy. As fall stretched to winter, I could tell that a small group of board members were unhappy with my leadership, particularly around my recommendations that we participate in the art space sanctuary initiative and decline <clears throat> and, and decre decline the missions event. The job of the director of a museum, <laughs> or any cultural institution for that matter, is difficult enough um, um, without this kind of doubt coming from the board. And after a grueling year end, I decided in late January 2018 to resign. It broke my heart to come to this conclusion because I knew I had so much more to contribute to the museum and its publics. There were a few board members who did not like that I was determined that the museum should take a position on events that deeply impacted our staff and surrounding communities via our operations, via the ways in which we functioned on a day-to-day -day basis. I believed that as, and I still believe, that as a cultural space reflecting our collective values that we could not remain somehow neutral, especially as the very foundations of democracy seem to be crumbling around us. Neutrality, in fact, is not at all neutral. Rather, to paraphrase the South African anti-apartheid leader Desmond Tutu, it is a position in and of itself that supports the status quo. And given how the museum had always operated, as well as its commitments to its own staff and collaborators, we knew the realities that confronted us could not be met with indifference. Since my departure from the Queen's Museum, I have been contemplating the history of how museums came to be in the United States, how they operate today, particularly in the in the ways their modes of storytelling embody specific politics, and how we might understand their connections to a whole matrix of power relations and ideologies. Amid calls for diversity, equity, and inclusion in our spaces of culture, there is no way around a confrontation with neutrality as a persistent ideology within the museum. In a sense, it is the expertise of the museum that makes it trustworthy that it selects art and makes exhibitions that are educational, that it instructs publics. However, there are many structures from operations and governance to curatorial choices and the treatment of staff that undergird these selections and the ways in which they are presented and interpreted by the museum that are directly oppositional to any desire for such diversity and inclusion. The problem lies in the fact that these structures are unseen and unregistered and that they undeniably privilege, it, privilege those of specific class, race, educational, and social backgrounds. If we truly want to undo barriers to inclusion, we must face this false neutrality and dismantle it. I'm going to leave it there, because you should read the book. They're for sale in the back. But I think Michael and I should have a conversation. And also, there's so few of us that if you want to come forward and, um, you know, feel a little more. We don't bite. Yeah, we don't bite. And also, we can, you can ask questions. Yeah. And thank you for reading that introduction to your book. I mean, it was such a deeply troubling situation and also inspiring. Um, I've read through this and I've reread many sections of it, as you can see, a few times. And it, you touch on so many great instances similar to your own, um, great colleagues and anecdotes in here. Um, I'll start out, I have a few questions I want to start out with, but I want to remind everyone that if you do have questions throughout the talk, write them down and we'll get to them near the end of the talk. So if it comes up in your mind, that's why you have the note cards there and Allison or someone will come by and, and fish them out of your hands. So, uh, I guess I want to jump in and just ask you, I mean, it's clear from your situation, how, how passionate you are. But what really, um, what drove you to write a book about you know, your own experience, but also other situations? I think I, I saw something that we could fix. <laughs> you know, I, I think that sometimes the things that, um, that are the most, uh, that seem really big and impossible and almost like too large to even take on, um, 
like sometimes you get a little glimpse into how it might be undone. And my glimpse was this idea about neutrality and about actually taking on this idea that a museum is somehow a neutral site and to look at the history of the evolution of the museum in the United States in particular. And I spend a chapter in the book really talking about that history. Um, and that's important because Many of the earliest museums in the United States were, um, were created mostly by, well, nearly exclusively by wealthy, older, white men of a certain educational class. And, you know, on a certain level, you know, I think about it this way. It's like, you know, if my um, dad or grandfather or great-great-grandfather or whatever, if they had lived in the United States at that time and were wealthy, and they decided to put together a collection of stuff that they just really liked. You know, this is very personal. You know, we all have the little things that we collect. Um, you know, it would be, um, you know, it would be highly subjective. <laughs> you know, it, and even if some of those things were in fact great works of art, you know, they're still highly subjective as things to like and enjoy. Um, and then what ended up happening, of course, was that you know either because subsequent generations weren't interested in those collections, or because the person who collected them themselves wanted to to gift them somewhere because they felt they were significant, um, they they gave them to their alma maters. They gave them to local libraries. Uh, the libraries libraries were often an early repository for objects that were collected by by people who were affiliated with them. And so you have a group of artworks then that gain a special status, not only as person X's collection, um, but then enter an institution as special object, right? With preferred and, status. And, and with that, you have a responsibility going forward as it evolves. How are you adding to this? How are you allowing people to interact with this? What is the importance of this? As you say, they start out as these very focused personal collections. Or even just like what are people exposed to? You know, if, uh, you know, I, I grew up in a certain kind of family, like, you know, we did sit, some things we didn't do other things. Like, I, you know, they, they may not have ever come across object Y that they might have and, wanted. And it's reiterating you know? the same thing, and, yeah. and you're, you're not seeing change. Exactly. And then, as you're saying, that the role of a cultural institution is to evolve to to where where they're situated as well. I mean, a world and a neighborhood grows up around them. The Queens Museum being a very wonderfully interesting and diverse place and becomes more to them, yes. more than what, what the original mission was. Right. And also, I think, um, beyond uh, what you do with the collection or even how you add to it, I think even just acknowledging the fact that the original collection and where the museum itself comes from, comes from a place that has a very particular sensibility. Mm -hmm. And that those objects that be became studied objects over years because they were in the collection of the, you know, the university uh, museum then became studied by generations of scholars and students and people who went on to be experts in their fields and got PhDs and blah, blah, blah. And, and those aesthetics of whatever those, you know, those objects were become part of that. And so there's a question of taste there that is ultimately very specific, you know? And so I think that matters as well. And so I, yeah, I use as an example in the book of, um, you know, of, of something that caused great controversy when um, the ICOM, the international, what does it stand for? ICOM, the International oh, Committee on Museums. Anyway, it's a very Health powerful, enormous, okay. Um, Josh will tell me in a second. That's my husband. Um, but a very powerful international museum organization, um, a group of people who are members, I mean, they have like 40,000 members worldwide or something. I mean, just, it's huge. Um, a group of members um, got together. International Council of Museums. International Council of Museums. There we go. Thank you. Um, behind every great woman is a... What, what's the phrase? A man again? with an iPhone? A man with an iPhone, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> so, um, yeah, so the International Committee on Museums, a small group of people got together and they were like, I think we need to update you know, our mission statement, like what we're here for. And they used phrases that were sort of consistent in some ways with what I talked about as the, um, you know, what the Queen's Museum's values were. They talked about polyphonic uh, historical uh, voices and, you know, museums being committed to a wide variety of histories and different approaches to um, historical matters, et cetera, et cetera. And there was a furor. I mean, major, you know, half the countries in Europe like threatened to drop their ICOM membership. It was like, uh, it was as though you had said the museum was now a public toilet and that was it. Um, and I say that affectionately because at the Queen's Museum I used to joke that people would come for the public toilet because we were in the park and there weren't very many other public toilets but stay for the art. So. Um, but you know, it, it was very. Um, so I don't particularly take that as an insult. But you know, it was very. It was a very particular kind of objection that people had to this kind of language because they wanted to be able to say, "But no, all we do, we don't do that. All we do is present stuff that is excellent." And it's like, well, when you say that, it kind of means that a lot of other stuff that you don't happen to have or that you don't really care about is not excellent. And that's just not true. And you have to face that. And you have to talk about why those particular objects ended up as precious objects, or in the case, for example, of the Benin bronzes, which I also talk about, mm -hmm. why they ended up in the museum in the first place, and how colonialism and the brutality of colonial rule played into why uh, everything from the so-called uh, Elgin or Acropolis marbles are at the British Museum and why those, um, those Benin bronzes are there as well. well it, yeah, it's how those, those earlier institutions formed. And what I, I find, uh, I mean, and that, that pretty much, you, and you cover really well in here. At the same time, you talk about some of the newer institutions that pose themselves as contemporary, as being part of the dialogue and being engaged with the public but in some ways become a bit ignorant to that uh, until they're really pushed. Yeah. And, and that you cover, I mean, your own controversy as well as what happened uh, in here, whether you, you touch upon the, the Sacklers or Warren Canders or, or um, God, why am I just... Uh, Sam Durant. Sa Sam, uh, Sam Durant, yeah. At the, at the Walker Arts yeah. Center. I mean, yeah. and these, these are places that are supposed to be inclusive, yeah. part of the conversation, no better. Yeah. Um, and, and this isn't just a slap on the wrist. These are major things that happen. So, I mean, that, that's wonderfully documented here. If you're not aware of some of these situations, it's great to see them all encapsulated in one place. Talking about these shifts, and it all resonates back to Cold for Institution as, as, a, as a hub mm -hmm. for the public and what that means to the public. Yeah, and I think how accountable those institutions are to various publics, right? Because I think, you know, in the Sackler situation, which I'm sure we've all read about because it's national, international news about, you know, the, the opioids that they peddled um, and how they acquired their wealth, um, or I would say the extreme part of their wealth, you know, I think there is a level of wealth acquisition that the, the opioids, um, um, enabled that is, you know, it's part of the vast explosion of, cons the, of the consolidation of wealth and power um, in the United States and frankly everywhere, um, you know, as we see in Russia. I mean, oligarchs are not only Russian. Um, so, you know, with the Sacklers, though, you know, and the, the kind of relationship between where the money came from, it's very easy to see the relationship between the problematics of where the money was coming from and how the cultural institutions then, you know, um, accepted that funding and, uh, and it became problematic once it became known that this opioid crisis that we are continue to be in the midst of in the United States and halfway around and all, all the way around the world as well is fueled by that and so how to, by that greed. And so how do we reconcile, you know, um, something as, um, as kind of horrible as getting people addicted to a drug that they then seek to buy perpetually um, that causes them to die or be very, very ill um, with 
the kind of ideal of a cultural space. It just doesn't seem to line up. And you know, and I think the the Whitney um, situation with Warren Kanders was similar in that you know he was he was a, a man who owned a company called Safari Land. Believe it or not, it was actually it's actually called Safari Land that produces less lethal weapons. An oxymoron, if there ever was one. It's astounding that that in many ways the public is not aware of the individuals who are philanthropically uh, supportive of an institution that is looking towards them to to bring their message forward. Like it, it, it's it's a complete contradiction. They don't stand for the same values as many of the people they're attracting to this institution or what they purport to be. Well, and it plays out, especially in contemporary art institutions, it plays out on multiple levels and in sometimes very strange ways. So let me use the Whitney for an example because the the way that the this kind of controversy came up was because a like, young journalist at Hyperallergic named Jasmine Weber wrote an article about the fact that this man sat on the board of the Whitney and I think was a co-chair at the time um, and owns this company that produced actually the tear gas that was at that moment being used at the border against the asylum seekers in Trump's so-called caravan. And so this was very much in the news at the moment and it was literally traced back to the, those events that were happening at the border and these horrible detention centers that were, were so, um, you know, were being very much, uh, were very much in, in, the daily, in the daily paper. And um, you know there was a huge reaction, and that happened on multiple levels. So amongst the staff internally, there was a crisis because they were like, "This doesn't jive with like how we see ourselves, our role in, you know, the in the as as museum workers. Like we don't, you know." And I wanted to, and and this for me was a parallel to my situation at the museum, where I was like. Absolutely. As museum workers, we're not excluded from society. And you know, we're, we're in it, we're part of it. It's like, we're all people inside these places. Like, we shouldn't just be you know, within a cone of silence just because we work at an institution. And so, you know, you had that piece, and then you had, pro and then you had uh, decolonize this place that then planned protests every Friday of the biennial. Um, you know, who knows? I, I'm certain. I, you know, I'm certainly some that the, the board was having very intense conversations amongst themselves about this problem. I mean, obviously, I'm not privy to that, but I can, you know, I'd bet money that they were. Um, and and you know, and then the final straw actually that led finally to uh, to Candor's resignation was the fact that there was a group of artists that resigned, or not that resigned, that said a few months into the biennial, if, if something isn't done, we want our work removed. And so the leverage, particularly of some of the artists who are more famous among that group, granted, and one of whom won the Melville Buxbaum Award and whose mm -hmm. sculpture was enormous, it would have been extremely problematic to remove. Um, but nonetheless, that was the tipping point. Um, and I left out one important piece, which is that there was also an artwork that was situated within the biennial, which is why, which is what the point I think you were getting to a little bit earlier that I didn't quite address, which is that in contemporary art spaces, these things can go even, can get really funky because there was actually a work of art that was commissioned for the biennial by forensic architecture and Laura Poitras, the filmmaker, mm -hmm. um, that actually did an in-depth forensic research investigation into all of the different places that Safari Land was um, you know, selling its less, le less lethal weapons. And it was a pretty explosive film. Obviously, Mr. Kanders was none too thrilled that this was in the museum that he was funding. But, you know, as has happened, uh, I'm certain, it, you know, I'm certain it happens here just because I've seen it happen in so many other circumstances that, of course, the, 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 the kind of party line by the curators and by the director has to be we're not. We're neutral in this. This is the work and thinking of the artist. And as a cultural space that has to be supportive of freedom of speech and the freedom of expression of the artist, we have to protect that. And how can you argue with that in the United States where that's like our highest value? And that gets, it really is underscored in a lot of what you write here is how the, the museums, cultural institutions cannot remain a neutral space. 
in the face of, of such topics like this. Well, and, and, and because it's not true, right? Like, I mean, they're not being neutral. They're actually, you know, mobilizing. They commissioned those artists to make that work, you right. know? <laughs> they're actually commissioned. But at the same time, they, 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 and they had this person on their board. I mean, it's such yes. a dichotomy. And so the, 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 the paradox and the kind of complicities are really complicated. It's not, it's, it's not, it's never, it's always gray, let's just put it that way. <laughs> So with that, I mean, you can read more in here. It's really interesting the way uh, Flower frames many of these situations and in, in great detail, which is nice, and great anecdotes from colleagues. Um, I would ask you a question before we reach out to everyone here. In, in, in your heart, where, where, do you, where do you want to see cultural institutions um, taking shape and evolving now? I mean, they, they are in a state of evolution, all of them, yeah. uh, from the oldest institutions, uh, the, the Met on down. Um, we're seeing change. Mm -hmm. We're seeing monuments removed or galleries rehung. They're they're rethinking things. They have they have uh, DEI initiatives, things of that nature. But you know, obviously, they can do more. Um, yeah. And nothing happens overnight. But well, where do you really see the role of a of a cultural institution? Well, I think that my my first my first preamble to the answer of that question is that. Cultural institutions, the diversity of cultural institutions, big, small, schools, you know, exhibition spaces, Kunsthalles, collection bearing, like they're really different. And you can't, you know, blanket provide, you know, just like all of us, we're all different. Like they have different histories, they have different propensities, they have different ideas about, you know, what they what they mean within the ecology, uh, within the ecosystem that we all participate in together, you know? You don't expect the same thing at the Met that you expect when you come here or when you go to a community-based arts organization in, you know, like like um, Brick or something, you know, um, in Brooklyn. So, you know, I think, I think we can't overgeneralize, but there are a few things that I'm going to generalize about, <laughs> having said my caveat. Um, and one thing is that we need to radically slow down cultural production. I think that almost every single institution out there, cultural institution out there, is moving too fast. And that is a result of late capitalism's pressure to produce more and more and more. And there is not enough time in the friggin' day to say you're gonna do the right things and do them well if you are just on the treadmill all the time. People need time to think, especially if you are actually committed to doing the equity work that these DEI initiatives claim to want to do. You can't just slap that on top of all the rest of the work that the staff needs to do. You actually need to create space to do that, time to do that, um, a, an environment to do that. And so there's a lot to be done on the interior. And to that point, I would say that even though it is like not the sexiest thing to talk about, human resources is where it's at in terms of the place where the most change can happen the most quickly. Because even like in really dumb things, like I remember at one point I got into a bit of a, uh, a discussion with um, the person who handled uh, job descriptions and you know postings of job descriptions at the Queens Museum, where I said, you know, we need to put, I said, why isn't the salary range on here? And she was like, oh, oh, that's just not done. And I was like, well, how is, I was like, okay, I don't care if it's not done. It's not fair and we'll waste a lot of time if we don't put it on. And we got into kind of a discussion about it. And she was like, well, I don't think we should do it. And so I was like, okay, well, let's do it your way. So we spent about three months narrowing down a can pool of candidates, da, da 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 having multiple interviews. I interviewed people, like other people. So much time, so much energy. The person we offered the job to could not accept the job because the pay rate was not enough. And I was like, okay, this is exactly why. This is an equity question because you're wasting, number one, you're wasting people's time. Number two, people need to know before they even submit their resume what, they're, what, they're going, what, what kind of a situation they're going to. It's not fair you know, to ask somebody to go through this whole process without even knowing the answer to that question. And so, you know, doing something as simple as mandating, a, a, you know, that a, that a job, that every job description has a salary a range transparency. Just, yeah, I mean, just. It's, so it's two ways, so you're, you're yeah. asking them for everything. Yeah, you're asking them for everything, not, and you're not giving them, I mean, come on. Sure. You're giving them three lines about what their responsibilities may or may not be. 
So, you know, I mean, we've all been there. Um, so, uh, so there's things like that that I think are kind of like the low hanging fruit. But then of course, there are the much more complicated things that I think uh, the unionization movement in the United States is really kind of addressing, whether that's at, you know, uh, you know, Starbucks and Amazon, or the museum, you know, the museum union uh, oh, the Whitney just... evolution. The, the Whitney just, um, the Whitney Union was just voted in, and you know, and I think that this um, that this leads to another 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 really core what change in the way we need to shift our thinking, which is that typically when criticized, cultural and most people, <laughs> but cultural institutions shut down. They go into the cone of silence, PRification zone of nothingness. And so suddenly all you get is this like blah blah thing that's a sentence, that's what the statement that the museum makes. It's coming from one institutional voice that is, who knows, you know, maybe it's the director, maybe it's, you know, just said the, you know, PR flack. And I think that this is like completely the reverse of how it should be because in fact those protests the, that critique is a radical form of care for the institution itself and to me what needs to happen is that all of us who work inside of institutions we all feel a certain amount of precarity because we know how delicate the balance is between making the income work and the expenses work and like we're always worried right michael we're always worried <laughs> <laughs> that, 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 that at the end of the year, you know, we have a lot of people who are counting on us for, you know, their salaries, for their health insurance. We, we rec you know, like the management of that is so challenging that, that, that any kind of arrow that's tossed at the institution feels very painful. But I think we need to be a little more resilient, you know, and, and steel ourselves and actually think through what those Right. Desires are sure, and not be reactionary and internalized. To, to, yeah. Is this something I need to address, or not, or, or are we doing this, or not? And also, and also to, uh, and also to, to say, maybe we are not one voice, and maybe that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, um, one of the things that was, uh, you know, um, you know, I was really interested in the whole controversy with, you know, Warren Kanders about what the various parts of the staff thought about how that was evolving and. Wouldn't it have been interesting for us as a public to somehow be able to, you know, they're very smart people who work at the Whitney, and I would have loved to have heard like how they were analyzing and processing because I'm sure it wasn't the same. It's not a monolith inside the institution. The institutions are made up of people. I used to always say about the Queens Museum, without the people, there's nothing. Like without, I mean, forget about you know the collection and the art exhibitions or whatever. What about opening the door, cleaning the toilet, you know, <laughs> welcoming you in? Yeah, yeah, and it's what are they thinking about the situation? So it's not just funneled through a director's voice. Or, right. or, or PR voice, and we did hear a little bit in the Whitney specific Warren Candace, You did hear a bit of that. It's now with increased social media and web yes. presence, you're allowed to get these anonymous things put out there. And there are now more. I follow lots of social media accounts that kind of put information like that out there, just to, so someone feels like they have a voice. If you're if you feel trapped inside an institution and you don't align with their ideals, then are you just performing a job? You're not. Really, right. It's not an inclusive family of, it's, you're, not doing, you're not there for the, reason, the right reasons. You're not there for what you thought you were there for. Right, and I think that oftentimes museums, uh, cultural spaces have relied on this notion that like we're a family to actually um, convince people that they weren't actually just, you know, that, that, their, that their labor was a labor only of love and not also a labor of survival and the precarity with which people yeah. sort of live in museums and you know all of that you know I mean, they're dependent on their salary they're dependent on their health insurance like we all know in this country that if you lose your job you lose your health insurance so you know let's not forget that you know in addition to our passions for the work that we do inside those spaces you know many of us, in fact after i left the museum uh, the queen's museum an artist asked me you know if i was you know upset that more people didn't quit at the Queen's Museum in response. And I said, you know, I, I would never presume. <laughs> also because I knew the, like, the conditions of those 
those workers, and you know they, they, that that's quite a luxury to be able to well, step back and, from and the job. And at the same time, you said, I like how you broke it out—a labor of love, but also a labor, labor of survival. Yeah. And many people still might even hold on to a false hope that it is the place that they love, mm -hmm. and could it be changed? Could it be the place that they want to be? But ultimately, is it about a, a, a labor of survival? And you know, again, looking back at where we're at, health insurance being very, uh, uh, at the forefront of anything you do. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Allison, you have questions for us. Yes, I think this is a wonderful opportunity to transition into the audience Q&A. Um, if you're still holding on to your question cards, don't be shy. Uh, please just hold them up if you have a question. Um, let me get right started. Uh, a question from Marsha. Thank you, Marsha. Uh, the situation at the Whitney was the opposite of yours, Laura. Because the director, Adam Weinberg, Weinberg. Weinberg. Weinberg, thank you. Uh, was against the resignation of Kanders. Mm -hmm. Thank you for helping me fill in. <laughs> um, he had given millions to the museum. Do you see these two situations differently? In your case, you set an ethical standard as director that wasn't supported by your board. Well, I think he here's the thing: is that the you know I, I think Adam was in a really pro difficult, you know, it was between a rock and a hard place. Um, but I also think that I, I am critical, and Adam knows this because we've talked about it. Uh, he knows that I, what, where I thought, where I was disappointed was when he, was in his response to the staff. Because when the staff letter came out, the staff wrote a letter to the director, not, to, not a public letter. It was not initially public. It was only um, meant to go to, to the director. And, you know, I think Adam is a very sensitive guy. He's, ve he's always been extremely accessible to his team. He's, like, super friendly. He's not one of these ivory tower type people. And, you know, um, they wrote this letter knowing that and really wanting to engage with him on what they were conflicted about. They were, if you read the letter, which I reproduce in its entirety in my book because I think it's a really beautiful document of how people, displaying how people care for the institution itself. And so their question to him was like, we feel like our, like some of our own identities are linked to the people who are trying to access the United States and get, gain asylum and our openness and our desire to um, create programming that, that communicates a, a certain kind of openness it, it is nullified by where this money comes from. And so how, how should we think about that? How, how do we, as a community of art workers and people who are engaged in this institution deeply, how do we work through that? And basically, Adam tells them to stay in their lane and that it, it's not really their concern. And this, to me, was a moment of that I was really disappointed because I thought, gosh, you know, this was an invitation to really sit down and say, okay, let's struggle through this together. Like, we have, we have a real problem because, yes, there are millions of dollars that this museum is sustaining itself on. And that is suddenly incompatible, well, maybe not suddenly, but <laughs> is incompatible with perhaps the way we would like to see ourselves. So how do we either change the way that we work, change what we do and how we do it in order to kind of shift that situation. And so, yeah, I do think our situations were really different, um, but, I, but, but I think they, they offer kind of like a different facet because I think in a way, um, you know, what ended up coming out of the candor situation was that, you know, well, none of, no money is clean. And it's like, well, of course. I mean, what are we talking about here? I just think that there are certain bridges that go too far, certain, you know? Certain ethical boundaries. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, and, and, and yeah, at certain times, certain things seem more objectionable than others, right? So, you know, and that's okay. Right, I think the difference there also is in, you, you, you leveled with your staff. Right? And you're like, this is the situation we're in, and I'm going to, to take this on. But you, you gave them why. Where in Adam's situation, it was a little more, I, I, and I agree. Like, I know Adam, he's very, very close with his staff, and that was a bit of, it was very out of character for him. Yeah. To say, it, it's almost as if he was going to fall on his sword type thing, where you, you thought next, like, his resignation was coming to protect them. You yeah. didn't know, um, but yeah, it seemed out of character. Yeah. 
Yeah, and I also, I just will say another thing that's not specific to Adam, but just as, um, you know, as it's a, it's a societal comment around um, the ways that the people who have the wealth and power and serve on boards have become ever more wealthy and powerful, that they determine who the directors of museums are and what their compensation is. And while it is nowhere near the gap between most CEOs in corporate settings and their workers, there is still a very substantial gap between what museum directors make. I'm talking about the bigger institutions. In a lot of the smaller institutions, there's very little gap. But in the big institutions like the Whitney and the Met, there is a huge gap between what the director makes and what most of the rest of the staff makes. And I think that that brings in other class, race, wealth transitions, you know, like other issues, systemic issues that if you're not extremely self-aware, you're not going to be able to navigate at all. Thank you so much. I'm gonna end with this audience question. I'm gonna add on to it because it is a question very interestingly about the front end of this accessibility. We, the museum visitors, this question is coming from, what role do you think admission charges play in excluding populations from museums? And I'd like to add to that, what is a call to action that you can give us as museum hmm. goers to start to recondition our thinking beyond buying Laura's book for sale on the back table after this program? <laughs> okay. Take it away. Um, okay, so I have so many, so much thought, so many thoughts about admissions. So at the Queen's Museum, we're, we really struggled, right? Because we. Uh, the city owns the building the Queen's Museum is in, just like the Met own, the, the city owns the building that the Met is in. And so we had suggested admission just as the Met, I think, still has suggested admission, yeah. but for New, <laughs> for New Yorkers, right. <laughs> so the Queen's Museum still has suggested admission for everybody. But, you know, you have to know what suggested admission means. Like, you have to know what that protocol is in order to take advantage of it. Like if you walk up to a sign and it says, suggested admission, $10 a person, $5 for kids, or you know. And $10 is this big, and suggested admission is this big. Is this big, or even if it says it big, like if, if English is not your first language, or if you've just never been to a museum before, like. What does that mean, suggested? Like, suggested like I can pay nothing? Suggested I can pay a dollar? Suggested I can, I should pay 10, but maybe I should pay 20? And so, you know, my experience at the Queen's Museum where much of our audience was not, uh, was, did not speak English as a first language, you know, the, the kind of, the way that you say that, so then we were like, we played with like, well, what if you say pay what you wish? Well, what does that mean, what I wish? I, I don't know, like, that's, a, that's like a contortion of English in a way. And if you literally understand those words, you may not understand like what they actually mean, mean for you to do. Um, to make it doubly confusing, there was like a donation box. I, I was just like, this is so complicated. <laughs> I don't even, but I wanted to make the museum free, uh, which has its own set of complexities, which the Bronx Museum went from being free to having an admission. Um, so, you know, there are all kinds of theories about what you do with admission. My main thing is that you should have a choice of what you give at the door. You, you should be able to give nothing. If you wanna give $10, you can give $10. I, I think that you should just, and, and how that's relayed is the problem, but I think you probably could have people who speak different languages as we had at the Queen's Museum <laughs> at the front of the museum and maybe not behind a desk even, maybe more approachable, maybe, you know, not looking like they're security guards, um, you know, talking to people about, you know, what to anticipate in their experience, providing them with wayfinding, you know, having, I think it, the, the whole front of house scenario at cultural space needs to be rethought, especially as we have, you know, now we've got COVID things, we've got security, we've got post September 11th protocol. I mean, like the front of house, operation is extremely intimidating no matter what institution. It's very, very off-putting. I, I had a, a great conversation a while back when an artist friend, he's from the Bahamas, he was doing a work for, for a, a, a large institution for a biennial and he opted to have his work outside of the institution. And you know, there was a lot of back and forth, like why would you want to do that, et cetera, and they, they let him do it. 
And I was talking to him about it, and he's like, he's like well, no, I, I want the public to be able to experience my work. He said, growing up, he would walk up to a building like that, and it's a beautiful building, it's imposing. It's like, I can't go in there. Yeah. It's like, there's too many things, I'm gonna have to pay money. I'm not gonna be welcome. Um, and, and then, of course, then what's on display isn't gonna be for me. Right. It's like, what, what, is, what is a person like me, growing up, feel welcome to this? Yeah. And, and it's hard now, like we, we look at our own situation, we have a, we're, we're lucky to have a, one, a beautiful building and we want to inspire people, say, no, no, you come, can come in here, we are subsidized education, but it's very imposing. You walk up to the Met and you're like, you feel like you're going to a courthouse, you're like, yeah. wow, what, what's gonna happen? I'm gonna lose so much money walking in here. Well, and that's actually on purpose, right? I mean, the way the Met looks, it was in part built like that because the image of American culture in a young nation was to portray a nation that was powerful, that was cultured, and that hearkened from the greats of Europe, but was here. And that power center was shifting. And that was part, I mean, the neoclassical design of so many museums in the United States, that's no coincidence. It's part of the colonial project. And so, you know, as we understand, you know, why these spaces are intimidating, it's because they were initially meant to be, not necessarily to the public, but they were meant to message a certain set of values around power and wealth to other audiences that and they functioned in a way that was was highly political that was communicating very specific agendas to a global audience and so i think like we can't separate those things now. And so in a way, wouldn't it be better rather than saying, oh yeah, we're doing away with you know, suggested admission because you know, it's too hard to make money, you know, to, to have the money to run this museum. And so New Yorkers, you can still do it, but anyone else, whatever. Like, and it has this very imposing, you know, but we're gonna be accessible, we're doing DEI stuff, yeah, we're gonna do outreach, blah, blah, blah. Just admit that the structure of this space and all of its holdings was created at a certain point to function in a very specific way in US history and amongst a particular group of patrons. And I think if you do that, you can tell all kinds of stories. It does, I mean, some of it's shameful, some of it isn't. Some of it is just fact, you know? And I think, like, let's just, I mean, the Sackler piece, like, we gotta change that because that's a problem. Uh, you know, but the rest of it, like, or maybe not all of the rest of it, but, mm -hmm. but you know, some of it you just have to say, okay, well, this is the way it was. And it doesn't make it okay, but if I acknowledge that and say, like, okay, well, and these are the, the things that I want everyone to understand about what that kind of history meant that we excluded, or meant that was excluded, or meant that was included, I think you get a long way, or you get a little bit further, in kind of um, addressing that. And I'm not, you know, look, I don't mean to pick on the Met. I just think it's a big ass <laughs> building and it's easy to do. I also think that there's probably a it. lot more than that the Whitney is gonna do or that the Art Students League might do to make you feel welcome than the Met is going to because it's such an international tourist destination. So the, there's another whole layer of, you know, economic complexities that play into that. Yeah. And I thank you for that response. And I think acknowledgement as a foundational building block is a really great place for us to conclude here. So I want to say thank you so much, Laura, Michael, and thank you all for being here. Thank you, Alison.